So uh, somebody in the, in the early service uh, found out that there were like three of us preaching today and, and they were like, oh, you know, like my roast is going to burn, you know, and like, kind of, um, we work this out. So we each got a section. You don't have to put up like three individual sermons. Okay. So sit back, uh, relax a little bit, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll learn something and enjoy this today. So, um, you know, one of the big thing, themes in uh, literature and movies uh, is this epic conflict, right, between good and evil. And the classic struggle pits ideologies or individuals against one another, right? I mean, one side is portrayed as good and the other as evil, and they clash. Uh, They meet in an epic battle. And many of of these um, books and movies with, with this kind of a theme have become number one bestsellers or block, uh, blockbusters. Um, some of you may uh, recognize um, the, uh, the number one bestseller, J.K. Rowling. Uh, if you've uh, read any of the Harry Potter stuff, uh, that is a, a classic, a new, kind of a new classic, good versus evil scenario. Uh, and her books, I mean, they're so popular. They made her the first... Uh, author to become a billionaire. And that's, that's really amazing when you think about it. She sold a lot of books. Other, um, other good versus evil epics are things like uh, Rocky uh, and Drago, right? Uh, the Russian uh, boxer and Rocky, Rocky IV. Some of you remember that. Um, some of you might remember Neo and Agent um, Smith in The Matrix, uh, if you watch the Matrix series. And uh, some of you that are, are a little older, a little before that time, uh, might remember Dorothy uh, versus the Wicked Witch of the West, right? In The Wizard of Oz. So, um, but, but you all know what the best uh, epic battle is, like, like in our time. What, what's the number one epic battle of good versus evil? Can you, do you think? I heard somebody. Star Wars, right? Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. Um, and while these, these tales of intrigue of good versus evil are, are fiction and they're meant to entertain, we learned last week that there really is a spiritual epic battle of good versus evil that's happening uh, even though it's unseen. And, uh, and it's anything but imaginary. Right? It's, it's not a work of fiction. It's not a work of, of somebody's imagination. The Bible says it's very real. Uh, Ephesians 6.12 in the, in the King James Version says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against the spiritual wickedness in high places. The battle of good versus evil is very, very real. And it's important to understand who the players are in this epic struggle. God's Word says our struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil. And we're going to find out more about the spiritual forces of evil in next Sunday's message that we're calling the real hell's angels. And you won't want to miss it. But before we go there, it's important to know that that we don't struggle in this epic battle Alone, We don't struggle against the forces of evil alone. Psalm 91.11 says, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you or protect you wherever you go. That's, that's kind of the, the verse where we get the idea that, that we all have guardian angels, right? Um, several weeks ago, I... Uh, I called to see how my dad was doing, and I want to take just a moment here to thank all of you. You, you guys have been so good at asking about how he's doing, and some of you have sent cards, and, and uh, he's really, really appreciated that. And he's told me that he has, has really sensed the prayers uh, uh, of our congregation as, and, and many other friends and family, of course, that have been praying for him. And um, he's doing all right. He's, he's making some progress. Um, But I called a a few weeks ago to see how he was doing. At that time, he wasn't doing very well at all, and they had just uh, shipped him back to Chicago to the uh, Cancer Institute there. And um, my mom said that he had woken up that morning feeling 
agitated and irritated and anxious, and, and that's just not my dad. My dad's pretty laid back kind of guy. Usually, uh, usually he's in a pretty good mood, and, and he's, he's always calm. He doesn't worry about anything, but he was anxious and agitated that day, and so um, she said, why don't you talk to him? And so she handed him the phone, and I I uh, sort of gave him a pep talk and, and tried to encourage him the best I can because he's always done that for me. And uh, before I hung up, I said, uh, uh, I said, Dad, can, can I pray for you? And he said, I'd appreciate that. And, and I got to tell you, that's always a little bit of an awkward thing because my dad's been the spiritual leader in my life, right? Been, been my pastor. And so for me to ha- take on that role in his life uh, is, feels a little weird. But I found that when I do that, uh, and I do it in other situations as well. People really appreciate that. And I would encourage you to do the same. You're talking about something that's going on in somebody's life and just, just say, hey, before we go, can I, can I just pray for you now? Um, and uh, that's, that's been a big, uh, meant a lot to a lot of people. And so I want to encourage you to do the same. But I did that to my dad. And, and before, um, be, be, uh, he said, you know, I'd appreciate that. So we prayed. And, and, and a couple days later, I called again, and, and uh, I was checking in with my sister because she was kind of helping with things, and he, she was there at the hospital with him and everything, and I uh, was asking her for an update, and we talked a little bit, and she said, oh, did, did Dad tell you about the angels? <laughs> and I went, uh, no. What angels, right? Well, like, like she sort of said it just matter-of-factly, like, you know, well, you know, the angels, you know, like, our angels. And I was like, I don't know anything about angels. So she handed him the phone, and I said, what are you talking about? What, what angels are you talking about? And he starts telling me that he woke up in the middle of the night, probably around three in the morning, something like that, and he said, I, I know I was awake because uh, he, she, he said, your sister was, was sleeping on uh, the couch that was in the hospital room there. And I looked over to make sure that she was still there and everything. She was there and she was sleeping. But she, see, he said, Steve, there were, there were five guys gathered around my bed. And, and, and he said, I, I really didn't know what to think of it at first. He, he said, I just, I just laid there and I didn't, didn't move and didn't say anything to them. But they were talking they didn't seem to be talking to me, he said, but they, they were talking to each other, and I tried to figure out what they were saying, but he says, I, I, I just couldn't understand what they, were, what they were saying. And I watched them for probably five minutes or more, he said, and then one by one, they, they kind of all turned and headed toward the, the door of the hospital room. And as they got partway across the room, they just faded into nothing. And so I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool, Dad, you know, and he was really shook up, you know. Of course, you can imagine if you're not doing well after cancer surgery and the angels show up, you're kind of wondering, are these the angels of death, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so he was a little shook up and, and not, not feeling real good about it, but I, I know he spent the last several weeks since then trying to figure out, well, who were these guys, right, and, and what were they doing? He's, he thought, well, maybe they were medical personnel, but they weren't dressed in, in scrubs or anything like that. They were they were dressed in work, you know, plain old work clothes. Um, and he said some of them even had like hard hats on and stuff. So it was really kind of strange uh, why they were there in that way. And, uh, but uh, he's telling me this and he's getting all choked up and getting emotional about it. And uh, like, like it really hit him hard. And uh, as he's telling me, I'm getting goosebumps, right? Up and down my arm. I'm getting goosebumps because I remembered my prayer from the night before. And I had specifically prayed Psalm 9111 over him. That God would send his angels to guard and protect him. Now, you know, it's weird. I wish we could confirm this somehow, right? But it sure feels like God answered a prayer and sent his angels in that moment and in, that, in the middle of the night to stand guard over my dad. And the thing that I found so interesting is that never before in all my life can I remember ever praying that God would send his angels to guard anybody. Stories about angels like that are, are, are very common. Um, I've been surprised, actually, at the number of people that I've talked to, even in our congregation, who have had some sort of angel experience. Um, some of them are more dramatic than others. Like, you know, like that, like that one uh, that my dad had, you know, that was impactful because 
uh, of the situation surrounding it, but I've heard much more dramatic stories of, of angels that have like ripped doors off of wrecked cars that were burning and about to explode and reached in and pulled somebody to safety, right? And, and you can read all sorts of stuff like that on the internet. And of course, um, we need to be careful because not everything on the internet is true, right? Um, but I think angels do show up. I, we see it in Scripture, and I, I think God does send His angels to uh, take charge over us. And they come in all shapes and sizes, young and old, and sometimes when we, when we least expect them. In fact, that's exactly what God's Word suggests in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, where it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. You know, but how do you know, right? How do you know if, if that encounter that, that you've read about or even your own experience is, is really an angel encounter? And, and I think maybe because we understand that, that things on the internet aren't necessarily trustworthy, we're probably even hesitant to share those things, right? My dad didn't want a lot of people to know, so I just kind of blew that. But, but, um, uh, but you know, he was really worried about that experience because, you know, people think you're nuts or something, you know, might be the, might be the pain medicines uh, talking, you know, or whatever. But um, it's, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, we're worried that, that our experience or that the story that we've read is really trustworthy. But here's something that I found interesting. A 2011 poll showed that 77% of adults believe that angels are real. 77%. Now, there's um, belief, uh, you know, in, is primarily tied to religion. In other words, um, most of the people that believe in angels are religious people. You know, most of them are Christians. In fact, 88% of them are Christians, and 94% of those who attend weekly religious services say that they believe in angels. But here's the, the interesting thing. A majority of non-Christians also say that they believe in angels. You know, it's encouraging, I think, that our culture accepts the idea that angels are real. But it's important to ask the question, is our understanding of angelology correct? Or is our idea of, of who angels are, uh, is that just more of a cultural thing? You know, do we, is our picture of who angels are and what they do, is that, is that sort of a uh, product of our culture? And the truth is, much of our understanding of who angels are and what they do comes from the arts and entertainment industry, doesn't it? Um, it's been a long, long time since I watched Touched by an Angel. Do you remember that show back in the 90s, Touched by an Angel? It was starring Roma Downey and Della Reese. And so um, because it had been such a long time and we were doing this series on angels, I thought, hey, it would be interesting to go back and watch an episode of that. So I pulled one up on YouTube. I think it was actually the pilot episode. And I watched that episode to refresh my memory and, and, and to see if the angels on the show were actually portrayed biblically. You ever wonder that? You see, you see some shows and, and you kind of wonder how accurate is that to Scripture, right? So in this episode... Monica is an angel that is given the assignment to stay close to David, a little boy whose mother ran away after her eight-month-old baby, uh, baby girl, David's sister, died in her crib. And Monica goes undercover and gets hired to be David's nanny. And she takes it upon herself uh, to find David's mother. And she tries to convince uh, David's mother that her son still needs her and to return home. And initially, uh, the mother refuses and, because she's just unable to, to face up to her tragic loss of, of her baby. But in the end, her, she unexpectedly returns and the family is reunited and everybody cries, right? You know, it's just, it's just one of those tear-jerking shows, right? Um, but... Um, as I, as I watched the show, I got to admit it was a little dated um, and it was a little cheesy and there might have been some artistic license taken by the producers, uh, like when Monica transforms this old uh, rust bucket of a car into a brand new shiny Cadillac Eldorado convertible. I, you know, that, that's a nice thought, but, but I, I, I just, I don't see anything in scripture that confirms that uh, angels can do that sort of thing. Um, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure they can't pull that off. But, 
But overall, honestly, I didn't see anything that directly contradicted uh, the biblical view of angels. In fact, one thing that they got right is that when Monica made it known that she was an angel, she actually glowed, you know, like, you know, kind of thing. And and she had this this aura sort of around her. And, uh, you know, we know from uh, Luke chapter 2 that uh, when the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks at night, that the, that the, uh, the glory of the Lord, right, shone around them and it terrified them. However, nowhere in the Bible does it say that angels have halos, right? Um, so we, that, that's, a, that's an artistic license that somebody has taken. Another myth that, that you no doubt have, have heard and are familiar with is that every time a bell rings, a what? Angel gets it. Yeah, right. You know, everybody's seen A Wonderful Life a hundred million times, right? Uh, it's a great show, but the myth uh, of an angel getting their wings, uh, no. There's nothing biblical about that. Um, in fact, um, you know, although some angels are described in Scripture as having wings, uh, in other biblical passages, there's no mention of, of angels having wings at all or even needing them. Um, which is another thing that, that uh, Touched by an Angel actually got right. Monica and, Wes, uh, Monica and Tess are portrayed as, as not having any wings. Uh, so I guess they got that one right as well. Um, also in Touched by an Angel, Monica and Tess, the other, the other kind of lead angel, are portrayed as female angels. However, most of the time in Scripture, angels are not given a gender. They're neither male nor female. In fact, only three times in Scripture do we even have names for angels. Um, I don't see if you can, can name them. Anybody know what one of them is? Michael? Gabriel? Ah, see, there's a myth. That one does not come from Scripture. Raphael does not come from Scripture. Um, the only other one is Lucifer. Lucifer. And uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, um, uh, you know, there's only those three angels that are named. Other than that, um, they don't really appear to have any gender. Um, oh, yeah, and those, those, uh, those cherubs that you see portrayed in, in Renaissance art, those little chubby angel babies, uh, you know, no. Uh, that, uh, that, that's just not how it works. Um, uh, actually, Jan's going to touch on that a little bit, in the, a little bit too. But, but the cherubim uh, are described in the Bible as having four faces. Four faces, one of a man, one of a lion, one of an ox, and one of an eagle. In addition, they're said to have two pairs of wings and two pairs of hands. And uh, so totally different than the chubby little angel baby that we see, right? Um, in fact, they were, they were mighty, mighty angels, powerful. And God assigned actually just one, but so assigned a cherub with a flaming sword to guard the entrance of the Garden of Eden to make sure that Adam and Eve could never eat from the tree of life. Um, cherubim are, are angelic figures that, uh, that you see that are placed on the, on the top of the ark. Uh, remember, remember Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant, right? Um, so those are the, the angels that are on top of the Ark. They're the ones that are cherubim. Also, the prophet Ezekiel seems to suggest that prior to his fall, Lucifer was the chief cherub. And of course, we have a lot of other cultural ideas about Lucifer too, which we'll talk about him uh, next week. But, but, you know, the important thing to remember is that our only reliable source for a correct understanding of angels in the Bible where, um, where angels and angels encounters are actually mentioned more than 275 times. Um, you know, that's the only place where we get our ideas, the accurate place, the correct place. So we have this, this challenge of figuring out what's cultural and what's correct, right? Um, so Janice, uh, Janet, tell us some a little bit more about what, what does uh, Scripture actually have to say about angels and how are they described there? Well, thanks for that introduction to angels watching over me. And the Bible tells us that angels, like men, were created by God. And at one point... Okay, there, there we go. go. That was nice. an angel touched by an angel. <laughs> that, that was me. That was, oh, oh, oh. Okay, all right. Well, I thought it was, was an no angel. angel. It was no angel. <laughs> <laughs> In 
In fact, I've heard that there are demons in the sound system at churches. <laughs> That's oh, uh, no. Okay. All right. Okay. Back so, <laughs> so back to what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. It says that um, angels, like men, were created by God. And at one point, no angels even existed. Um, because, you know, there was only the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so Colossians 1.16, Paul tells us that for through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things we can see and the things we cannot see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities. In the unseen world, everything was created through him and for him. You know, angels are part of the things that we do not See, a good uh, point to grasp is when Paul, he says it in the next verse in 17, and he says, he existed before anything else, and he holds the creation together. Angels would cease to exist if Jesus, who is the Almighty God, did not sustain them by his power. And I love that. You know, and that's the team that we are on. We are on the Jesus team as believers in Christ. And in Hebrews 1.14, we learn that angels are servants. Spirits sent to care for people who inherit salvation. In fact, their nature is that of a spiritual being. They do not have power to reproduce, as Pastor Steve was kind of alluding to, um, so, you know, they're not making these little baby angels. So they're not doing that. They, they can't do that. Um, but they, and, and they do not possess physical bodies, although they may take on physical bodies when God appoints them to a special task, which kind of gives me chills after hearing Pastor Steve's story about his dad. They do not marry, so they do not have the ability to experience the love and togetherness that married couples feel. Well, on most days that married couples feel. <laughs> so, you know, if you're having one of those rough patches at the house, you know, you could just always go, gee, if I, God had created me as an angel, I would not be married to experience this. But, um, and then in Mark 12, 25, he goes on and he, you know, for when the dead rise and they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like angels in heaven. So they do not marry. And, and, and so you think and you go, well, how many angels are there? Enough for everyone to have their own guardian angel? Perhaps, perhaps. But God never told us exactly how many angels he created or how many are in heaven. The Bible indicates that there are more angels than we can count. One version says there are myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of angels. The Greek word for myriad can be translated as tens of thousands. So myriads of myriads means that there are more than 100 million angels. So that's huge. That's a lot of angels. And if you think about that, in the United States, in 2018, we have over 300 million people in the United States. So use that as a comparison. But no different than when we look outside into the sky and all the stars are shining. We have no idea how many angels there are nor how many stars there are in God's creation. Psalm 68, 17 says, The chariots of God are twice, 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Matthew Henry, um, a commentary, he says, he says this about that verse, and he says, Angels are the chariots of God, his chariots of war, which he makes use of against his enemies, which he sends for his friends, we are his friends. So a chariot is, um, you know, it's a vehicle-like item that is, you know, that's used in war. So think about that. You know, angels are chariots of God. So when your enemies seem to outnumber you, or family, friends, co-workers, and everybody just seems to be against you, remember, angels are for real. They are organized by God, and you could even consider them to be an extension of the arm of God. That's a Billy Graham quote, and I just love that. You know, an extension of the arm of God. Remember the power, uh, the prayer that uh, Pastor Steve mentioned uh, when he was praying for his dad and for the angels to be sent before him. You know, how many of you here today has had their life impacted by an angel? Angels can become visible when necessary. They can appear and disappear. They think, feel, and display emotions. Angels are mightier than men. 
but they are not gods, and they do not possess attributes of the triune God. Billy Graham says, he said, angels' knowledge of earthly matters exceeds that of men. So they know more than we do. And there's a verse in um, 2 Samuel, and they're talking about a king, and they say, but you are as wise as an angel of God. So they were saying that, you know, he was very wise. Angels are not omniscient as God is, though they have a vast amount of knowledge. They do not know everything. They do not know about the second coming of Jesus, and we know that from Mark 13, 32. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven are the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Daniel 6, states, My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. See, you have Daniel in the lion's den, and somehow his sight evidently perceived the angelic presence of an angel. He sensed that. In Daniel, we also learn that the angel presence can be observed on occasion by people in the unbelieving world. So after the three Hebrew children that you guys have probably all heard about, heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow down, and the angel preserved them from being burned alive. And so this king, who was part of the unbelieving world, he looked in and he saw three men and another. So he saw four men. He saw the three Hebrew boys, and then he saw an angel. At the end of the day, the point is not whether angels are invisible or visible. But God causes his angels to go before us, to go before you, to go with us, and to go after us. I love how God just surprises us, and he even surprises us with angels. Think about it. God created this vast host of angels, invisible and visible, to help accomplish his work in this world. When we have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, we should be confident, and you, each of you can be confident that the angels of God will watch over you, they will watch over us, and assist us because we belong to God. Thank you, Janet. Um, it's easy to see, as we've heard a lot here, uh, about how active angels have been in our history, in the history of mankind. Uh, but the question is, for me, the question is, are they active today in our life? How do they impact our life today? Um, Job 38, 4 through 7 tells us that when the earth was founded, all the sons of God, meaning angels, began shouting in applause. And uh, this tells us a few things about angels that I think is important. First of all, that angels themselves were created by God um, before humans were created, even before the creation of the earth. So when the, crea when the earth was created, they were all together and joyfully crying out together. I think another thing that's kind of interesting about that is then that probably was before Lucifer uh, rebelled against God because it says all the sons of God um, rejoiced together. So uh, sometime between the creation of, of earth and the, and, and, uh, the creation of man, um, Lucifer fell. And so that's kind of an interesting thing. At that time, all the angels were part of the united family of God. Um, the, the uh, third thing is, um, or the second thing is that they have feelings, that they joyfully cried out. So the angels are not these non-feeling entities. They have uh, feelings. And uh, third, they're emotional about God's plan for us. So their feelings are, are toward us. They love mankind. Um, the faithful angels, as opposed to those who sided with Lucifer in the rebellion against God, the faithful angels are interested in human activity. Um, I think we're a wonder to them. I think they look at us, and so many of the things, Janet, that you mentioned that they can't partake of, they look at us and they kind of are curious. Ever since they witnessed the creation of the first humans, faithful angels have shown this keen interest in uh, the growing human family here on earth and the, and the outworking of God's purpose for us, for mankind. With the passing of time, however, the angels also experienced watching human beings move away from their creator, um, falling away from God. And no doubt this saddened them. But we also find um, where they're excited when a human returns to God. The scripture says joy arises among the angels when one who has fallen returns back to God. 
Um, since angels have this deep concern for the welfare of humans um, who serve God, it's no wonder that God has repeatedly used angels to strengthen and protect his faithful servants on earth. Let me remind you again of times when angels were directly involved in the lives of God's faithful people. Um, two angels helped the righteous man Lot and his daughters to survive the destruction of the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by leading them out of that area. Um, an angel came and ministered, ministered to Elijah when he was depressed and uh, wanted to die. Listen to what it says in 1 Kings 19. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. In the New Testament, angels supported Jesus at the start of his earthly ministry. And uh, shortly after Jesus' death, an angel appeared to Jesus, um, or before Jesus' death, an angel appeared to Jesus and strengthened him. In the first century, an angel freed the apostle Peter from prison in answer to the church that was gathered to pray for him. Although invisible to human eyes at times, when they wish to be, they can be uh, visible, and they are very powerful um, in protecting God's people, especially from the plots and the plans of our enemy. They have a mission and a strategy, just like the fallen angels do. First of all, they have a mission to support and encourage God's people. Um, I think that's why they've been created with this emotional tie towards us. It's kind of nice to know that, that the beings that God created to care for us do care about us. And um, they, they cheer for us when we hunger and thirst for God. They, are, um, they come to our aid when we're challenged or threatened or distracted from the mission that we have to faithfully serve God. They're saddened when we begin to drift away from God and when we cease to bring Him glory. And, um, and, and then they have another mission as well, and that's to intervene on our behalf for the glory of God. Just as the angels intervened uh, with Lot and his daughters, with Peter's deliverance from prison, and in caring for Jesus um, after his temptations, they are ready and eager to intervene for you and I as well. Um, I want to share with you just a couple of stories. It's really interesting. Between the two services, and about four or five people talked to me about their personal stories um, of when they believed that they were being ministered to by angels. Um, when I was pastoring my first church in Battle Creek, Michigan, a man approached me after one of the services. He just kind of came up to me. I'd never seen him before. And he asked me, what time do you normally come over on Sunday mornings to the church? I told him, I said, I usually come over about, about 6.30, uh, between 6.30 and 7, to turn the heat on, turn the lights on, and do any last-minute stuff that needs to be done around the church. He said, my name is Bill. I will meet you here Sunday morning at 6.30 for prayer. It was really interesting. It was not a request, um, and so I, I agreed. <laughs> I'll, I'll be there. And so that next Sunday, a little bit before 6.30, I walked over to the church. I lived right across the street from the church. I walked over to the church. I unlocked the front door. I turned on the lights. I walked into the sanctuary, and there in the front seat sat Bill. I walked up to him, and I asked him, I said, Bill, um, how did you get in here? And he never even pretended he heard me. He simply said, are you ready to pray? Then he knelt down at the front pew and invited me to join him. So I knelt beside him. When we were done, there were a couple of things. When we were done, first of all, the first thing I noticed was his part of the seat cushion was soaked because he wept as he prayed. It was soaked. Secondly, uh, I was amazed at the time that had passed. I thought about 15 minutes had passed. We were praying for over an hour, which I think was the first time I had ever been engaged in prayer that lasted that long. Um, I remember that Sunday, a couple of things. I remember that I felt like I had been in the presence of God. Secondly, I remembered that God's power was really on me that Sunday as I preached. And, um, and I saw Bill a few more times. Um, he showed up just moments in, before or in the midst of a board meeting that was a very difficult board meeting. And um, he spoke a few words, and it changed the whole tenure of the, the feeling of the board meeting. And, uh, but he left as mysteriously as he had come. When he, he just was gone. Um, another story, in my first ministry position as a youth pastor in Philadelphia, um, I used to drive back and forth to Allentown, which was a little over an hour, and uh, I made $56 a week. 
Um, they provided housing, and that was my salary. And um, in my haste to get to school on time, I got stopped for speeding, and the fine was $76. So you do the math. Um, I was really discouraged. I was very depressed and defeated. And um, uh, we had no groceries at the time. Our, our cupboards were bare. And I remember feeling so bad. Um, that evening, I searched for um, loose change anywhere in the house I could find. Because all we had in the house were a few cookies and a box of powdered milk. Now, I love milk, but not powdered milk. Milk <laughs> should not be blue. Um, and so what I wanted to do, I scraped together some loose change. I was going to go to the store, and I was going to buy some, some cheapo syrup so I could drink the milk, some chocolate syrup. So I drove to the store, um, went in the store, went immediately to the back of the store where they had a, a, a grocery cart with dented and reduced cost items. And I couldn't believe it. I, I pulled out a dented can of Hershey's chocolate syrup. And because it was dented, I could afford to buy it. And I remember this. I remember it because I thought this was critical to the rest of the story. As I was walking to the checkout, just feeling so thankful, and I was praising God that a dented can of Hershey's syrup was, was available to me. I'd only been in the store maybe 10 minutes, no longer than 10 minutes. Paid for the item, went out to the car, and when I opened the door of the car, um, I had a little Chevy Chevette, and when I opened the door of the car, it was full of groceries. When I say full of groceries, there was only room for me to sit in the seat directly behind the wheel. Every other inch of that car was stuffed with groceries. In fact, I, I thought I had the wrong car, so I quickly shut the door, walked around, looked at the license plate, and it was my car. And then I looked around to see if there was somebody lurking in the shadows, you know, snickering, or if there was somebody waiting to, to take credit for what had happened, but there was nobody. So I hopped in the car, I drove home, and when I unpacked the car and un, uh, unpacked the, the bags of groceries, I couldn't believe it. It was like I had made a list of everything my family loved most. Those were the items I was pulling out. Baby food for my, my daughter at the time. All the food she liked and none of the food she didn't. Briar's coffee ice cream. If you know me, you know that that is my favorite, absolute favorite ice cream. And there was ice cream in there, which also brings me to the fact that it was summertime. And those items were put in the, in the hot car. And if I had been longer than 10 minutes, if I had been, say, 30 minutes in the grocery store, many of those items would have been ruined. But I was only 10 minutes. And so I came out and I thought, how could anyone have known all my favorite things? How could anyone have known I would only be there 10 minutes? And, and to this day... Um, I don't know how those groceries got in my car, but I've stated all along that I believe an angel packed my car with groceries and then disappeared. I believe that with all my heart. One, one last um, thing, and I believe angels or an angel has been a part of my life all growing up. I could tell you story after story after story. And, and I believe that God was rescuing me and saving me so that I could answer his call to ministry. In fact, um, Scripture says the angel of Jehovah camps around those fearing him, and he rescues them. Steve and I um, were coming back from a motorcycle trip to Florida, and as we were coming back, there was unusually high winds and rain. And we were um, the other side of Fancy Gap, and uh, Steve was in front of me. We passed a semi. We were in the left lane. We passed a semi. I think the semi saw the motorcycle, Steve, but didn't see me. So Steve went around him. Instantly, he pulled over and ran me off the road. I was doing 70 miles an hour and hit the grass median, and it was an incline. I started down towards the base, the bottom of the, of the, of the median, and there were these concrete drains, and I knew if I hit one, I was done. And, and believe me when I say this, I thought I was going to die. I really thought I was going to die. And um, I just thought to myself, oh, God, oh, God, please, no, please, no. And I thought, my wife is going to get a phone call. My sons are going to lose their dad. And my grandson's their poppy. And the bike started wobbling, and I just held on. And then it stopped wobbling. It smoothed out. And then I steered it back up towards the, the road, and I put the front tire on the rumble strips, and I shut off the bike. And I was shaking really badly, and I just sat there for a little bit. Steve had gone down um, to the first, there was a rest area, and he pulled over in the rest area. He had no idea where I was because I had an intercom, but we had lost because of the wind. All the towers were out. 
And um, so a little while later, he was just waiting for me, and I hope praying, you know, <laughs> wonder where I was. Um, and I pulled in, and I saw him. And um, when I saw him, I just started to cry. And um, he said, what happened? And I sat down, and um, first service, he said, when I came up, he thought I... He was shaking like he was dancing. I mean, he, he, literally, he was just shaking like this. And so we sat there for a while, and, and then we continued on. And, you know, I know, I know that an angel, I know that God sent an angel to, to grab hold of that bike and smooth it out. Um, I like to think that my guardian angel um, is retired now. Um, <laughs> I, I decided after that ride that I was, I was done riding. And uh, you know, many, of, many of you in the church have motorcycles, and, and more power to you. But I just knew after that day I was done. I just knew I was done. Sold the bike, sold everything I had that belonged to the bike or had anything to do with riding the bike so that I, I kind of burned the plow. You know, I wasn't going back. And, um, and I just think there's an angel now in heaven going, <laughs> he's retired. He's kicking back, taking it easy um, because he's done. But that scripture means so much to me because I know that I was rescued by an angel. Um, those words ought to be a comfort to all of us who are followers of God, not only because we do things sometimes and we need to be rescued, but we also, we also are surrounded in this world by evil creatures who want to destroy us. And we have this promise that if we are followers of God, his angels will rescue us and protect us. You know, this series is called Unseen. And um, I was thinking, if we could only, if we could only have seen over this lab last week, how many angels were diverting weather that could have been way worse? How many angels were rescuing, rescuing families from floodwaters? How many angels were delivering people or, or rerouting cars or having their hand on cars as they traveled through the floodwaters? Even now, if we could see what is unseen, how many angels are in this room right now? How many angels with a hand on your shoulder saying, I want you to hear this. How many angels protecting us from, from maybe Satan's influence all week long? Maybe you've been beating yourself up over something. Or maybe you felt lonely or felt alone. How many angels are whispering words of encouragement right now in this very room? How many angels are encamped around this, this property saying to Satan and, and the evil spirits, no, you can't go in. You are not allowed. This is, this is holy ground. You can't go in. I wonder how many angels are active right now in this room in our lives that we cannot see. Maybe we need to continue to pray, as we said last week, that God open our eyes, not only that we would maybe see angels, maybe some of you don't want to see the angels, but that we would be aware. Janet, you said something in between the two services. You were talking to Pastor Steve, and I love this. She said, God has given us so much. He's given us his son. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us grace. He's given us each other. He's given us angels. How do we mess up? We have this whole support unit in our lives, and yet we continue to mess up that we would be aware of how much God loves us and the resources he has put in our life and among those angels to guard us, to watch over us, oh, that we would leave here today and remember that we are not alone, that God loves us, and the proof are the angels He's assigned to us to watch over us. Can we just bow together for prayer? Father, I thank you. I thank you for loving us so much that you haven't left us alone. On the contrary, God, we, we have a whole crowd of, of resources that you've given to us. But God, we get in trouble when we see this world and we see the things our eyes can see and we begin to believe the lie that this is all there is. And like Elijah, we feel like we're the only one left. And then an angel, how ironic, an angel comes to him and helps him. God, I pray that we would have our eyes opened, that we'd recognize that you have given us so much and among those angels to watch over us. So God, we pray that you would continue, continue to watch over us because we need it because we make bad choices and bad decisions, and then we live in a world where even nature is groaning, even, even nature is out of control. But even in those moments, you protect us, you watch over us. And then 
as we're going to hear more about next week, we have a whole host of enemies who just want to destroy us. But greater is he who is in us. Greater are the resources you've given us than he that is in the world. So God, be with us, we pray, and make us aware of the resources you've given to us and the protection that you've provided for us and that we are not alone. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you go, I want to ask you to do something. Um, we have posted that, that bumper video that we had, uh, what we showed just before the message, uh, was on our Facebook page this week. And I shared that uh, with my Facebook friends and got like 300 and some views. Um, people out there are interested <laughs> in this idea of spiritual warfare and things. And uh, we're also posting these, these messages on that too. So here's what I'd like you to do. If you've got a Facebook account, share those things this week. Don't just, don't just like them. You can like them. That'll help. But, but share them on your, uh, on your Facebook with your Facebook friends. And let's see if we can't uh, get some more people from around here that don't have a church home to come and, and be a part of this and hear uh, what's going on in the unseen world and, um, and maybe be responsive to uh, an unseen God, right? And... Uh, uh, so let's, uh, let's do that, uh, share that this week, and let, let's just see if we can't uh, drum up some, uh, some business for the Lord. All right? Have a great week in the Lord.